Okay, welcome to you all. Um, it's a quarter to three in uh, Central European time. Uh, so it's time to start this session. Um, I would like to ask Nina, Alex, Musa, Tanya, and Hannah, whether it's able to turn on your camera so we can see each other. We're a small group and it would be good to see each other's faces if possible. Um, we have a, a final session for today. We already had three uh, different uh, uh, sessions, parallel sessions. We had the opening session yesterday. Um, and, and they're all very much thematically focused on uh, teacher education in pandemic times and the, uh, 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 the lockdown, distance learning, these themes all come up. And what's striking me is that many discussions on uh, teachers or schools and teacher education in, um, in the time in times of Corona, that there are much attention to learning outcomes and what's the impact of uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic and school closure and distance learning for learning outcomes. There's much attention to the concerns of pupils and the concern of teachers. But up till now, I haven't seen so very many studies uh, and, and, and discussions looking, really looking in, but what's actually happening in schools, in classrooms, in uh, courses. And I think the interesting thing of this session is that it tries to look into the black box. Uh, so what actually is happening when we're talking about distance learning? What kind of, of activities, what kind of, of, of uh, uh, interventions are taking in, in classes, what's, ha what's actually happening. And I think we have three very interesting uh, sessions, one from uh, 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 the University of Ljubljana, one from a secondary school in Slovenia, and the final one from, uh, uh, po from Poland. And I think it's very interesting to see how they uh, um, probably approach the, the black box from a different way to see what are common elements and what are differences. Uh, we've agreed to have three different sessions uh, right after each other, so a maximum 20 minutes of presentations and then to see whether there are any clarifying questions. So at the end, we will have some uh, time to discuss the connections between the three different presentations. If that's okay and there are no other comments, that I, then I suggest that we start with the first presentations by uh, Mira Metliak and uh, Tina Bohak Adam from the University of Ljubljana about uh, music uh, student teachers and their use of ICT during the lockdown. Mira and uh, Tina. Yes. Yours. Thank you, Ma uh, Marco. Uh, first of uh, first of all, I want to share with you a screen. Can you see my screen? It's coming, I think. Yes, there it is. Okay, great. Just wait a minute here. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I really want to extend a very warm uh, greetings uh, and welcome to everyone. Uh, we are very glad uh, to be this part of this conference. And uh, yes, our presentation will be divided into four, uh, four important points. First of all, I want to, to share with you some uh, information around uh, background uh, around uh, our uh, presentation and our research. Then uh, I will uh, share some information around distance teaching of music lessons in Slovenian primary schools between the epidemic. And then my colleague Mira will, uh, will have presented um, our research and results of our research. The occurrence of coronavirus disease, COVID-19, in 2020 has dramatically changed everyone's lives. This change uh, also very quickly affected the education systems worldwide, and the majority of the educational institutions tried to find new ways to accommodate uh, the educational approaches. 
the lockdown uh, has accelerated the adoption of digital technology and we can say that COVID-19 has become a uh, catalyst for educational institutions worldwide to search for innovative solutions in a relatively short period. Without much more time uh, to mull over educational details, all learning was redirected online as everyone had to self-isolate in their homes. According to the Digital 2020 reports, more than 4.5 billion people used the internet in last year, while social media users have passed the 3.8 billion mark. Nearly 60% of the globe's population was online. UNESCO reported that 1.5 billion children and youth were affected by school closures in 195 countries due to the pandemic. And half of all students did not have computer access and more than 40% were without internet access in their homes. Consequently, most school, uh, schools in these affected areas were finding stopgap solutions to continue teaching, but the quality of learning is heavily dependent on the level and quality of digital access. According to Gary A. Burke, distance learning, also uh, called distance education, e-learning and online learning is a form of education in which the main elements include physical separation of teachers and students during instructions and the use of various technologies to facilitate student-student or student-teacher effective communication. This period, we can say that has been a very crucial time also for the teaching profession. Practically without training or planning, an entire generation of teachers has effectively digitally upskilled themselves. We point out that this unplanned and rapid move to online learning has illuminated many benefits despite some problems. Sloan figures out that learning with the ICT support can promote more interactivity among students and provide opportunities that may not have been possible before. Xin Yang explains that it does not depend on being in the exact physical location and increasing uh, participation rates. Moreover, online learning can be a very convenient means for communication among participants and instructors because they do not meet in person. As we can see, Fedainich and Widinoa highlight that limitations of online learning can vary depending on the instructors of students, technological abilities to access online sites and use computers. If we are looking uh, into the field of music education, uh, we can say that uh, we haven't uh, found much, uh, much researches uh, around that, peri that COVID period. But anyway, uh, we found some of this and uh, I want to share uh, with you some of them. Marshall at all explained that teachers of music, art, and physical education in the USA faced particular challenges. It's not easy to teach primary uh, students engaging music lessons without being physically together because they miss these crucial music education fundamentals. Several art teachers think that even when their students had access to technology, the internet and other supplies, they often lacked the art supplies necessary to participate in the types of instructional activities they would typically assign. Dabney and Foti discuss the effect that the COVID-19 pandemic has on music education in schools focusing in the on the United Kingdom, one of the few areas where all children and young people are supposed to receive a general music education. 
A possible worry for post lockdown time is the children and young people will have had very, very different musical activity experiences and learning in lockdown. And it could be a considerable disparity between the haves and the have nots when schools do finally reopen. On the other side, Carillo and uh, Asunsao Flores figure out that online teaching and learning practices related to social, cognitive and teaching presence is identified. And we need additional research on experiences also in the music area. In the Slovenian educational system, a primary school music teacher uh, at the subject level can be somebody uh, who has finished a university study program, music education, or a Bologna master's degree in, educa in music education. If we look closer to the programs uh, that educate future music teachers, we can find two programs. Uh, a study of music education at the University of Ljubljana Academy of Music and the study of music education at the University of Maribor Faculty of Education. In the above study programs, we note that no so much emphasis is given to ICT knowledge. At the Academy of Music, uh, there is a general competence of information literacy, that students should acquire, but no particular subject can be detected in that manner. On the graduate uh, master's programs, we can find uh, multimedia one and two, where students give the general knowledge around ICT. Similarly, uh, at the study of music education, uh, we can find uh, in Maribor, we can find a particular subject uh, of information communication technology in the graduate master's program, and we can point out that knowledge of digital literacy and ICT usage in education for teaching music is also integrated into fundamental didactic subjects. We can presume that so the struggle of on the spot change from the face-to-face uh, -face learning to the distance learning in music education in great deal depended on the teacher's self-learning and professional in-service training. We emphasize that also years of work and experiences are a significant part of qualitative teaching also in that COVID period. Over the years, uh, teachers get the necessary working experience, which holistically impacts their individual development plans, creativity, and also the lessons creation. In the period between the 12th of March until the 1st of June last year, when the Slovenian government officially proclaimed uh, the start and the end of the epidemic, also music teachers uh, in primary schools uh, completely held the class at the distance, no matter if they, if they have had enough knowledge for the effective use of ICT or not, or if they have already used the sort of technology in the music lessons. Willingly or not, music teachers have been given a precious experience in that field and raised the digital literacy, which is, as we note, very, very important for further music teaching in post-epidemic time. Now, I will have given the floor to my colleague Mira, who will have presented our research. Mira, please. Yes, hello, also in my name. Uh, I will shortly, short, shortly present the research we conducted with Tina. Uh, first, I will tell the, our main problem was, uh, as Tina said, that uh, we noticed lack of um, targeted pre-service um, education in ICT and uh, digital literacy in uh, music teachers, um, in service music teachers and also the on-the-spot transfer to digital um, uh, long-distance learning. So these were our main problems. And the research questions were, um, in all the research questions, we were uh, asking ourselves if there were differences according to work experiences. And uh, uh, we were asking ourselves about the ICT usage 
in music lessons before and after the epidemic, uh, what was the level of knowledge and digital literacy also before and after, uh, how did music teachers um, respond to distance learning, uh, how did they um, upgrade their knowledge and um, if they had any um, help with that. And also we had one open questions about um, advantages and disadvantages about the uh, distance learning. So this was our uh, primary um, goal to reach. So the sample was uh, in total of 83 music teachers, primary school music teachers, as, as Tina explained, and the, the majority was female. And they were from one, they had from one to 40 years of uh, work experience. And for the research, uh, we divided them into three groups from one to five years, six to 15 years, and 16 years or more. So these were the groups that we then checked uh, if differences appeared. The method, we had a quantitative research, we had a questionnaire. Uh, the questionnaire was applied online in September 2020, so uh, after the first wave, let's say, and uh, after the uh, holidays. And then we processed the data with SPSS program for statistical analysis. So, and now these are the results of this <laughs> statistical analysis. Uh, first, if we, uh, we can see uh, the results of um, the question, uh, uh, for what did uh, music teachers uh, use ICT before the epidemic? And mostly we can see that there were no differences about uh, work experience years, but we can notice that um, may, most of them used for um, playing video records and the older group also used it for uh, playing audio records. These were the main two uh, answers that they gave. And this was before the epidemic. Okay, then um, we asked them if they had any uh, education on ICT uh, in music uh, class. We can see that a lot of them said that they didn't have any education. Um, oh, sorry, this is not the, the question. I, sorry, <laughs> I took the wrong uh, question. Uh, we asked them about if they had any problems. Sorry. And we can see that in all age groups, uh, quite a lot of them said that they don't, didn't have any problems, but we can see that um, uh, the majority of most of the one to five years least experience had problems with reaching the curriculum goals. And also the other groups had some problems with that, but we can see that a quarter of um, older or more, more experienced groups also had technical problems with using ICT. Uh, during uh, online teaching, but the difference was not statistically significant. Uh, we also asked them about the digital um, literacy assessment. They assessed on the five point scale of uh, very bad and very good knowledge. We can see that the um, assessment was higher after the uh, epidemic. Um, during and after. So in September, the, epidemic, uh, the assessment was higher than before the epidemic. And the difference was statistically significant. We also checked um, if uh, in all uh, working um, groups, the difference appeared, but we can see that only in the most experienced group, uh, the difference is statistically significant uh, about the before and after. Um, assessment. So the other groups didn't improve so much as we can see. And um, the third table shows that we also checked if there were differences uh, before and after between the groups, the, those three groups. And we can see that um, the difference appeared from uh, um, with the most experienced group. The most experienced group uh, improved, uh, assessed higher in both um, uh, in both measurements before and after. So, and they assessed themselves uh, lowest uh, uh, before and after the epidemic. And now the question that I started to discuss before: uh, <laughs> if they had any education on safe and critical use. We can see that um, 
uh, not that some of them had it, some of them didn't have it. But the differences is shown that uh, younger or less experienced ones had uh, more um, education in pre-service education, but um, more experienced groups had in in-service education during their professional work. So we, maybe we can um, see that now also in um, uh, pre-service education, the ICT uh, knowledge is more um, is given more um, more pressure. Okay. Uh, how did they upgrade their knowledge? Uh, we can see that the difference was no um, was not statistically significant between between the groups, but uh, we can see that most of them upgraded their knowledge with self learning, uh, and some was also. Uh, some was also organized at their education and training. So, but most of them was self-learning. If they wish to uh, upgrade their knowledge, the difference is statistically significant. The less experienced don't want to um, upgrade their knowledge so much than uh, the more experienced um, teachers. And this is uh, in a way of organized um, education, not by self-learning, but if they want to have uh, training in the future in this field. About advantages, um, you can read it on the screen. Uh, some of them said that they want uh, that uh, uh, this distant learning is um, uh, it's quicker in transfer of information. Uh, can give better performance and more accessible presentation. Some said that uh, the communication was better, um, that collaboration between students was better, uh, more transparent, um, more enrichment of listening videos, and so on. So the, diff the, the answers were quite different and um, yeah. And now the disadvantages, um, lack of personal contact that we all know. Uh, some stated that uh, problems with hardware and software, lack of social contact, impersonality. So the answers are quite the same as we uh, can say them uh, in everyday life. Uh, and now the, uh, the usage of uh, ICT, we can see that uh, the difference between before and uh, in the future, how much they will use it in school is statistically significant. Uh, before, um, a bit less of ICT uh, in percentages was used in music teachers. Um, less than 50% uh, was the percentage was a third of them said it. But in the future, uh, most of them will use it around 50 to 69%. So a bit more, but not, let's say, in majority. Um, less, uh, more than 70%, so something in between. Um, here's also the, um, if anybody would be interested in the uh, differences between uh, uh, years of experience, the, the, the difference wasn't statistically significant. So um, we can see that maybe the uh, less experienced use it a little more and um, more experienced use it a little less. Mira, could you try to conclude? Yes, um, I have just these conclusions and I'm right. finished. Um, so as we, could, as we saw, uh, music teachers with less working experience use ICT more and have fewer problems than those with more uh, working experience. Uh, music teachers evaluate their ICT knowledge and digital literacy statistically significantly higher for the period after COVID than before COVID. Uh, digital literacy was self-assessed highest by younger colleagues in teaching and lowest by those with 16 years of experience or more. Music teachers with more years of working experience would more like to further educate in the field of ICT than those with less. Uh, music teachers in majority improved knowledge with self-education in the epidemic time. 
and the development and the maintenance of digital competencies of music teachers is an urgent need and a requirement of lifelong learning. Uh, one of the critical problems is the danger of the majority of ICT usage in the music lessons, because this reduces the fundamental activity of music lessons, which is essential. The music teachers should regularly include performing, listening, and creating in their music lessons by supporting innovative ICT usage. So these are more content uh, conclusions, which maybe Tina will in the discussion say some more because I'm statistics, she is the content master. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, and I think it's very clarifying presentation looking into the uh, uh, the way in which uh, different groups have used ICT and feel comfortable about it. So thank you very much. Are there any clarifying questions? Uh, I Eva, have, Eva. Yes. yeah, just uh, what like uh, surprised you the most? Because, you know, uh, younger versus elder, more experienced, less experienced, but what was sort of most uh, surprising for you? Um, maybe if I could, say, if I can say just in the light of numbers, I thought that all of them improved a lot more, not just the, 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 more, the most experienced, um, statistically um, significantly. Uh, the younger groups didn't improve so much, um, but maybe that is because we use um, internet and uh, computers a lot. But uh, ICT in didactics is different than just using computers uh, in everyday life. So maybe I, I thought that all the groups would improve um, statistically significant before and after the epidemic. Me one, well, maybe not surprising, but, but comforting outcome was that um, the uh, group with less experience, which is the group which has left uh, initial teacher education rather recently, uh, uh, in the majority said, well, we had ICT competence within teacher education. So I think that's at least a comforting idea that it's, it's becoming part of, the, of yeah. initial teacher education. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll come back to that in the, uh, um, uh, in the central discussion. But first, let's move to Slovenia, uh, to a grammar school. Uh, grammar school, uh, Vida Prijark. Uh, Yes, yes, primary school, Vida Yes, probably didn't pronounce it very well. Christina uh, Margai, and yes. it's great to have um, a, a teacher from a, prim from a grammar school within our, uh, our group uh, to talk about um, uh, the black box of uh, German classes uh, and the way in which distant learning is used there. Christina, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So good afternoon, dear colleagues. I would now like to share the screen with you. Uh, so I think you see now my screen. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yes. OK. So uh, as you mentioned before, I'm Kristina Margai. I come from Ljubljana, Slovenia. And currently, I teach at the primary school Osnona Šola Vide Prigac in Ljubljana. Uh, my today's topic is how to achieve optimal distance teaching and learning experience in distance teaching and the evaluation of three distance teaching methods in German in primary school. Uh, before I start, I would like to briefly summarize the background our study set out. As we all know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic drastically changed the way of our lives and the way of teaching, especially the teaching in primary schools has become a great uh, problem due to the very young population uh, that needs a constant presence and guidance uh, of a teacher in a teaching process. Further on, uh, also teachers had great difficulties how to reorganize, uh, reorganize their classes and how to get the best interaction with the pupils 
um, in this distance teaching experience. So as we all know, there were many teaching methods and different apps on the internet that we could use. So as um, if I may say so, we were forced to find as uh, teachers a uh, new alternative teaching methods which, which would simulate the situation in school so that we could get the same or at least similar results uh, as in teaching in schools. So um, we have here three different teaching methods that were commonly used when I was teaching German classes. The first one is video conferencing uh, via Zoom. Then we have the second, pre-prepared videos, including a lecture and instructions for additional work. And the third one is uh, or are pre-prepared instructions, including worksheets for pupils' individual work. Uh, all these three uh, teaching methods had the, their own advantages and disadvantages. So um, an objective evaluation of these alternative methods was needed. Therefore, the aim of our study was to optimize the distance teaching uh, experience and the uh, objectives were to evaluate the efficiency of the three distant teaching methods I met mentioned before and to compare these three, uh, the efficiency of these three distant teaching methods. Uh, before I go uh, further on, I would like to stop share, uh, uh, to share uh, a new video with you. I would like to show you one of the, the, the teaching methods I use, uh, pre-prepared videos. Um, just a second. Christina, can I just uh, yeah. interrupt? I'm not sure if the sound will share, so you have to check that. Uh -huh, okay. uh, on up uh, when you're sharing, yes. click on more and share sound as well, yes, so that yes, we will hear course, sound as well. Okay. Uh, share sound and optimize for video. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I think so. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Oh, no, just a second. Mm -hmm. Yes, so this is a, a short video or a short insert I would like to show you. Uh, when I was recording the videos, I always used the recording program uh, OBS. Uh, can you see now this video or? Hello? Don't see anything playing. No, no, not yet. Okay. okay. But you see, yeah. but you see my face that is there. Yeah, okay. a million times. Let's see what happened when you yes. click, no. click play. Uh, so uh, when I recorded these videos, I always recorded uh, a certain topic in German and Slovene language so the pupils would fully understand a specific topic. And now, just a short insert. Hello. Unser heutiges Thema ist der Imperativ. Ali Buslovensko Veleni. Und was ist der Imperativ? Wie bilden wir Imperativ? Gut Volimo Veleni. Der Imperativ gibt es in der zweiten Person Singular, in der zweiten Person Plural und in der dritten Person Plural Sie. Tvorimo ga torej v drugi osebi ednine, drugi osebi množine in v vikalni osebi tretji osebi množine. Und jetzt ein Beispiel, primer. Das Verb kommen, priti, najprej spregamo v drugi osebi etnine, drugi osebi množine in tretji vikalni obliki. Potem najprej v drugi osebi etnine prečrtamo osebo ter končnico in tako smo ustali, ustvarili velilnik. Kom, pridi. So, yes, that's maybe just a short insert from this video. Now I would like to go further on. So uh, the aim of our study, as I said, was to optimize the distant teaching experience. And here we left uh, my presentation. 
I would like now to present, um, yeah. Sorry, I think that something isn't working properly. If I may have a second. Okay, now I think it will work. The lack of computer equipment. Um, okay. So the subjects that were included in this study were 50 pupils from our school, uh, from fourth to sixth grade with German as a facultative elective school subject and pupils from seventh to ninth grade with German as a compulsory elective school subject. The methods that are used in this study uh, was a questionnaire, a simple questionnaire regarding three criteria, uh, time efficiency, motivation level and understanding of the topic. Also, I evaluated all these three methods during the oral examination. As a method, I used a chi-squared test. Uh, and now uh, the questioner. So we see here, I had only three questions regarding time efficiency, understanding of the topic, and the third criteria motivation level. The first question uh, regarding time efficiency was, by which teaching method did you learn a specific topic the fastest way? Please rate the methods using one for the most appropriate method and three for the least appropriate method. Uh, the second criteria, understanding of the topic. Here I asked the pupils, how would you rate the three, three teaching methods? Which one was for you the most appropriate to learn German the most effortless way? And the, the third criteria, motivation level. Here I ask the pupils, what teaching method or methods gave you the most energy to work or learn a specific topic? Um, now the oral examination. Uh, here for the most of the topics, I used always a combination of two or three teaching methods. So the pupils would fully understand a certain topic. Uh, sometimes I only used uh, also inst instructions when I was teaching vocabulary, new vocabulary, uh, and that was it. But I always used uh, uh, a combination of uh, the two methods, uh, pre-prepared videos and um, um, video conferencing via Zoom. And now the results. Uh, here, as you see in these plots, some subscripted letters indicate statistically comparable methods. As we see uh, in time efficiency in the first criteria, uh, video conference and, and pre-prepared videos uh, could be uh, statistically uh, comparable. Uh, the second criteria, understanding of the topic. Here we see in this plot, um, there were no uh, statistically uh, differences. And then the third criteria, motivation level. And now we can go to the first teaching method I used commonly in my classes, video conferencing by Zoom. This was the method of choice. The pupil rate, uh, pupils rate this uh, type of teaching method as the most appropriate to learn a new topic. Um, also uh, regarding the time efficiency, uh, this, um, this teaching method was very good and the motivation level stayed here uh, very high. Uh, I suppose that is so because uh, there was a constant uh, guidance uh, of a teacher and the advantage of this teaching method was that if the pupils had uh, any understanding problems, they could ask immediately the teacher and solve the problem. Um, also, the, the teaching method was very time efficient. And um, the only disadvantages this teaching method had that if the, there was a lack of uh, computer equipment or if the pupils had a poor connection, they could not fully attend the classes. Uh, the next teaching method, pre-prepared videos uh, that I showed previous, uh, we see here uh, that this teaching method was very time efficient because the pupils could watch the video several times and um, 
the understanding was also uh, good because uh, the videos were uh, made in a very, um, how could I say, simple manner. Uh, when we see the motivation level, uh, here the motivation level was a problem if the pupils had technical problems. But the disadvantage of this method was that it, if they uh, could not open the video, they, they did not get an overview of the topic at all. And now the third teaching method, instructions. Here we see that the pupils rated in these plots, uh, these teaching methods as the uh, lowest or uh, the least appropriate teaching method because there was no guidance of a teacher, or as I would say, the, the teacher's guidance was there, but it was hidden in the text. Um, the advantage of this teaching method was best that the instructions were written in a very simple manner, but uh, if the, the pupils uh, did not um, read fully the instructions, they would not get, uh, or they could not do their work on their own as good as they should. The motivation level uh, as seen in the third plot uh, was also very low because there was no guidance of a teacher. So the advantage was uh, that this, the instructions were written in a simple manner, but the disadvantage was that there was no guidance of a teacher. And the results of, of the oral examination, as I um, had the oral examination, I uh, saw that no major understanding problems occurred when using more teaching methods, uh, especially when I was using uh, video conferences and uh, pre-prepared videos, there were no uh, bigger problems. Uh, but uh, differences in learning results occurred uh, when using only instructions. So overall, the results of the oral examination uh, were very good and the grades were very high. And now to the main findings. Uh, as we have seen, the quality of experience differed between the three teaching methods and the, the effect of a different teaching methods varied significantly, whereas a combination of two or more methods proved to be the most effective. So the combination of video conferencing via Zoom and pre-prepared videos simulated the best the situation in school regarding the three criteria I mentioned before, motivation level, understanding uh, of the topic and time efficiency. Um, so uh, the conclusions were that within the limitation of the study, the combination of two or more teaching methods provides optimal teaching and learning experience that leads to successful educational results, which showed also the oral examination. And um, now I would like to, to say another word and close this uh, uh, presentation, that uh, not only the teachers uh, were there who guided their pupils, but uh, also an important role played the presence of, their, uh, of parents who helped and guided their children. So uh, thank you for our attention and uh, have a nice day. Christina, thank you very much for your very clear presentation. Um, and um, I think within teacher education, we might very much try to uh, educate uh, uh, inquiring teachers who, after having finished their teacher education, still are uh, uh, involved themselves in research projects. And uh, I think it's, it's great that uh, you at least took that up. And I think that's not always the case when I look in uh, teachers in the Netherlands, they, they, take, they take such a uh, uh, a systematic inquiry approach to their to their teaching. So congratulations with that. Um, Thank you. So any clarifying questions, maybe? Anna. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, that was an absolutely fascinating comparative study. Um, I've read quite a few studies, um, and that's the first one I've seen that's that's looked across those methods. I've got questions about it, but I'll leave those for the later discussion, but just okay. to clarify, you did all that teaching 
and you did the research study yourself. Yes. Okay. Thank you very That's much. Quite amazing. <laughs> Thank I just you very to much. Check. I was like wondering where your whole army of researchers was that helped you with all of that. But, yeah, yes, um, I had to, uh, a small army, uh, a toddler and a three-year-old. <laughs> Okay, so triply amazing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any further clarifying questions? Then we'll come back to this in the main, in the, the, the main discussion. Um, and it's interesting to see that we, we started with um, uh, music teachers and to see, okay, what about their ICT use? And then, so that's partly of open up the, 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 the black box. And, and you, Christina, even went deeper into the deep box, not just the use of ICT, but what type of use of ICT or type of use of distance learning and what are the differences and what's the impact of that? So that's really going into depth. Um, so now let's see, this is both about teachers in schools. Um, what about student teachers within teacher education uh, uh, online courses? So let's move to uh, Melanie Alice from, from Silesia University of Technology in Poland, who looked at an online course for teaching English, uh, for teaching English as a foreign language within primary uh, teacher education. Melanie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope that's visible. My slide show is there and you can hear yes. me. Yes? yes, it is. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, so I'm not going to give you very much of a review of the literature because a lot of the data I have is qualitative and to give me time to read some of the student responses, um, I've cut the theory for which I apologize. The rationale that I'm taking is taken from the idea of self-study. So Corthogen in 2006 asks for uh, teacher educators to make explicit their practice in order that we can look inside this black box of how teacher education takes place. So what I'm trying to do is to make clear the principles that I applied in designing a series of tasks for a teacher education course. And I'm going to give you the context that I'm working in. So I'm in Poland, I'm working in a university and I'm preparing teachers to be teachers of English as a foreign language within the primary education system. And this is the initial qualification. It, to get full qualifications, they have to go on and do a two years master's course after this. Um, it's a six semester program and this data was collected during the fifth semester, which was the second wave, if you like, of COVID. So it was from October 2020 until January 21. Um, it's part of a composite program. The methodology of teaching English as a foreign language in preschool and primary has two parts. So part of it, part that I was teaching is called the practical part. This is a 30 hour program within this fifth semester, which actually continues, is continuing now with another 30 hours this semester. And at the same time, a colleague of mine was teaching a lecture course in the same topic, which was 15 hours. The practical course is assessed by coursework and the lecture course is um, assessed by examination. The university policy is that classes should be taught synchronously, so live, um, online, and we use Zoom for that. And together with Zoom, we also have a Moodle platform where we can post um, different kinds of material and where learners can upload their own um, assignments. So the educational outcomes that we are supposed to achieve according to the syllabus, and this is the syllabus which applied regardless of COVID, um, are that the student, among other things, has to be able to demonstrate that they understand the whole, the holistic approach towards the development of uh, preschool and primary children and apply all of that to the teaching of foreign languages and also to be able to plan and conduct um, teaching lessons um, 
using appropriate techniques, methodology and aids, which include um, ICT for teaching of primary, for, for teaching of foreign languages in preschool and primary. And also that they're supposed to be able to reflect on their own um, development and plan for their development for the future, understanding the concept of lifelong learning. Now, within when you're thinking about planning a teacher education course, of course, there are lots of different tensions that are going on. And one of the big tensions is the balance between the theory and the practice. And the second tension that we always have is the, the tension between what happens in school during the practicum and what happens in the university. And this was compounded because of the uh, COVID situation, because the practicum was disrupted. Many of the students did not have the possibility, because schools were closed, they didn't have the possibility to do the practicum in school. And they had very different relationships with the mentor teachers. Some of them were able to continue doing some online learning, some of them were not. So I was very concerned in the planning here, um, of trying to make sure that they had some sort of practical experience on which they could draw. The other problem is the uh, approach to where do we look at developing individual competencies in teachers or do we take a much more holistic approach to developing the teacher learner as a person who is going to be able to work in school. And then within the university, we have the tension between who does what in the lecture and who does what in the exercises and how do we balance the two things together. I'm referring to Darling Hammond 2016, thinking about those different things. Now, the traditional approach would be to have the lecture part as the theory, which is done as a transmission um, and is tested by an examination. My colleague does this to a certain extent, except she tries to um, get the teacher learners to apply the knowledge in practice. She insists on having an oral examination for the lecture course rather than um, a test where they simply click buttons. Now, the again, the traditional approach to the classes is to give a kind of recipe book. So you get lots of different ideas for what you could do teach, this is how it's been traditionally taught in the past, and it's tested by some sort of um, product approach. So you have to produce a certain number of, for example, presentations or lesson plans. Now, my difficulty with that, I came into this course for the first time this year, is that I, for me, this clashes with what we know about teacher learning. So from our knowledge of teacher learning, we know that teacher learning is socially constructed, um, you learn through contacts with other people, you learn dynamically over time, you bring to it, and particularly as a language teacher, a prospective language teacher, you bring with it all of these thousands of hours of your own experience as a language learner, and obviously your observation, uh, your apprenticeship of observation, as Lorty says, in school, uh, either as an observer or as a teacher during the practicum. And you're interacting with the uh, educational materials with other people in your group and so on and so on and how much you take up of this is self-regulated so and it also depends on your beliefs and how much you are willing um, and wanting to engage in the process so what i'm trying to do within that is to create a space for learning um, van leer talks about uh, affordances. So you can't make somebody learn, you can simply create, this is also um, Rogers, you create a space in which somebody can learn something and it's up to the learner whether they take that up or not. But I'm think, trying to think about what kind of tasks is it that will give the learners the possibility to learn. So I'm looking at the idea of a framework which has scaffolding within it. So taking of Vygotsky's idea of the zone of proximal development, but has space for maneuver, has space for creativity, so that different teacher learners who are obviously coming at this from with different experiences and with different ambitions and with different investment will have the possibility to adapt to it individually. 
So these spaces also need flexibility for to allow for individual work and to allow for cooperative work. And what I then decided was, okay, well, let's go for building up a portfolio of tasks and at the end of the course, ask the learners to come back and reflect on this portfolio and the experience of doing the tasks. So my approach to task design, this is an old film that you may or may not have come across. This is a film, Dr. Doolittle. And Dr. Doolittle had this creature called the Push Me Pull You. And as you see, it has two heads and it has a problem. There's a lovely song that goes with it. It has a problem trying to decide how it's going to go in different directions. And in order for it to be able to work, the two different entities have to work together because if they pull against each other, it doesn't work. So they have to negotiate to decide which way they're going to go. So I've taken this as a metaphor. Um, and I'm calling this the push me pull you design for teacher education <laughs> courses. So I'm looking for a task which gives incentive in that it pushes the teacher learner to try something new. So it's pushing them outside their comfort zone. It's pushing them into trying something that they might not necessarily attempt if left to their own devices. Um, but at the same time, the task needs to contain enough structure and support to be able to pull along those who might be more reluctant or who might not be so interested in this, enabling them to be able to do the task, uh, like being able to join the dots. So if they go through it, they get to the minimal idea and they learn how this approach might work but they don't have to put tremendous amount of investment in it. But at the same time, I don't want to be prescriptive. So it does need to allow for choice. So it has to have some kind of framework and the framework, because this is going to go up as an asynchronous task on the Moodle. So they're going to be doing it offline. The framework needs to have enough structure that I'm not going to be bombarded with questions about what do you mean in the instructions? So I'm going to give you an example of a task about storytelling. So this is the instruction that they had on the Moodle. So the aim of this task is for you to develop your storytelling skills. You have a choice. You can either read a story aloud as if you were telling it to, reading it to young children, or you can tell a story. So we've got here the minimal, less risk-taking version as you can read it aloud. And the more risk-taking version is you can tell it a story and you can use whatever prompts you want. And more specific scaffolding with instructions. So if you want to read it aloud, you could use, we'd, we'd looked at a website where there were examples of story picture story books, and there's a link to that. So for those who wanted the minimal version, they could take a, a choose from a selection that was already there, or they could choose one that they wanted, but not from the course books. It needed to be an authentic story for children. And record yourself reading about three minutes of the story as if to very young children. And then the practical instructions for how to do this. If you want to tell a story, then record about three minutes of yourself telling the story as if to very young children. Clearly, there's an authenticity problem here because they didn't actually have the children there. They had to imagine but interesting things happened. So at the, this was one example of a series of six tasks that they had to do over the semester, which went into their portfolio. At the end of the semester, I asked them to reflect. So your task now is to choose one of the five, sorry, there were five, not six, I can't count, five assignments and write a short piece in which you reflect. How did doing this assignment help you to understand more about the process of teaching young or very young learners? Why did you choose this assignment to write about? And how would you assess your achievement in the assignment that you did, the strong points, and what would you like to change? So I'm going to give you some examples from what the learners said. And I hope this will show that they were able to uh, interpret the task in different ways. So this is the first teacher learner speaking. 
this was a written task. So this task made me realize how important it is for the teacher to fully contribute to the lesson with small children. While doing this task, I experienced how hard it is to gain a child's attention. And while we managed to gain it, how hard it is to control his or her behavior. It occurred to me that the way a teacher speaks is crucial for the child to understand and remember information presented during the lesson. At first, I tried to record myself while I was recording, while I was telling the story to an empty space. And I must say it was difficult to pretend that somebody was listening to me. I couldn't get it right because I felt it sounded fake. I turned for help to my cousin and I was allowed to tell the story to my four year old niece, Amelia. Having an audience made my storytelling more natural and real. I was able to see her face expression and overall interest in my story, which made me feel like I was doing a good job. However, it, in that way, I could also observe how hard it is to keep a child quiet and subordinated. During my meeting with Amelia, it was hard for me to record myself telling the story because I was constantly interrupted by her laughter or talk. Although she was very interested in the story, her excitement could not be controlled by me and she kept asking questions or stood up from time to time. And she continued on about this. So you can see that this was a sort of uh, surrogate experience for the classroom. The learner didn't like the task, so she was creative and she found another way of doing it. And she had a learning experience doing part of it. I questioned her about the use of the word subordinated and whether you can actually keep children under control in this way. But it would seem to be quite genuine within that. Here's a second learner, teacher learner, talking about the same task. To be honest, I was quite surprised when I found out that we'll be discussing storytelling in the context of teaching a foreign language. Flashcards are helpful as well as a puppet. These were two other tasks that they did. But I wasn't sure about telling stories. I was so skeptical that I decided to prove everyone wrong. I decided to do an experiment. After completing the storytelling task, while teaching in kindergarten, I was involved in many lessons with young learners. Those children always talk and do something in that class. There is any silence, never. During one of my lessons, I started to read a short story in English. I used every technique I'd known to make it interesting and sorry, exciting. Um, I was reading slowly, emphasizing every word that should be emphasized. I was trying to imitate every character's voice and I even was showing, using my face to show the emotions, but the result was astonishing. Those always loud children patiently listened to the story while sitting quietly. They were really interested and they did not even spot that many of these words were probably unknown to them. I was skeptical, but this lesson proved me wrong. It turned out that their storytelling, that storytelling is an effective activity. Children are exposed to a target language and they acquire knowledge unconsciously. By now, I told so many stories to kindergarten children that my storytelling assignment would be much better. So again, she's taken the task. She didn't like it as it was. She set out to tell me that I was wasting her time and had a a discovery experience along the way. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. Sorry, I forgot to look when we started. You've got another three minutes. Okay, I'm just going to jump off that one. So I asked the um, students at the end of the course to evaluate um, how they felt the task. So the first question, were they interesting? It was a four point scale to push them in one direction or another. So as you can see, um, 11 out of these were 17 responses. Unfortunately, not there were 30 participants, but unfortunately, not everybody um, responded to this agency. Um, so overall, they thought it was interesting. They enjoyed the tasks, but some of them clearly had some thoughts about this. They helped me to think about approaches to teaching. And this came out quite strongly positive. They mixed, slightly mixed views about how much time the tasks took them. But they did feel um, that the tasks helped them to develop new teaching techniques. 
So to conclude, the tasks appear to offer affordances for learning, and this was based on the material from the reflective task. The design allowed for differentiated responses, so the learners were able to apply self-regulation and agency. Um, it, the design also seemed to allow for innovation or creativity, so we had a variety of different um, responses to that. It did certainly pushed teacher learners to try new techniques that they were not enthusiastic about at the beginning and on the whole were positively evaluated. The two things that were questioned was to some extent the time that, that required was required by them to do the tasks and the number of tasks that they had to do. I deliberately increased the number of tasks because I was really worried about them not not having the practicum. Uh, together with that. So they had a rather heavy load on this course, heavier than they would have done. So in this presentation, I've endeavoured to engage in an intentional and systematic effort to unlock the black box of teacher education, to turn the lights on inside it and to shine spotlights into its corners, rafters and floorboards. And I've been thinking particularly about the question of, of design of tasks. Thank you very much. Melanie, thank you very much for, uh, again, a very clear pr presentation. Um, and I think uh, after Christina's presentation of a self-study, we have another excellent example of self-study. And, and to, it shows how strong that um, um, uh, teachers or teacher educators doing uh, engaged in self-study on their own practice can be. And I would like to thank you very much for opening up your your own practice and your design thoughts in in in, um, in the courses you're you're teaching and to open them up for colleagues for further discussion uh, uh, so thank you very much for that thank you um any clarifying questions towards melanie can i ask Good afternoon, Miroslava Chernochova. Hi, Mirka. Uh, hi. Uh, please, I would like to know, because I'm also a teacher educator and uh, at the Faculty of Education, I am responsible for IT and informatics teachers, student teachers. So my question is, if you, Melania, uh, could meet your students to see how they apply what they learned in your uh, teaching no i didn't have that possibility uh at all these are these are students i've actually never met mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um because i teach the third year and i i've not had classes with them at all so this was another um excitement of it so, so <laughs> and the other problem is that when we're working together they don't very often have their cameras on so I don't even know what some of them look like I've had to learn what their voices sound like to be able to identify them so yes I can see Alma is <laughs> uh, so again it's lovely to be able to for, for these recording tasks it was wonderful because they actually recorded themselves the the platform unfortunately has um, practical cap capacity constraints so they couldn't upload videos uh which is a shame but they did upload audio recordings so no i don't know i'm i'm only working on secondary data thank you thank you thank you Anna? thank you um yes thank you so much melanie i'm um and for your lovely storytelling yourself um i'm almost tempted to sign up for your course next year <laughs> Um, Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a, I suppose it's a sort of a bit of a, a personal professional question, clarification. Um, you described at the beginning your what seemed to be a, almost a culture shock um, of this traditional approach uh, to teacher education, just to check that I've understood the context of, of your work. Are you, were you saying that it's the current situation um, that really enabled you to test these new approaches? Or do you think you would have been able to do it anyway? I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure if you could just clarify, um, did you see this 
you know, as a special opportunity to try your what seems to be your own kind of um, philosophy and passion for certain uh, for a certain methodology. That's that's a very good question. Actually, I hadn't thought of it like that. Thank you for that. Um, no, I don't think it's a result of COVID. It's it's the the design of tasks and the design of teacher education courses is something I've been thinking about for the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. And I think perhaps the COVID situation has sharpened it because it's it's condensed everything. Um, right. And I have more information about what the teacher learners are not doing. If... <laughs> Because um, under normal circumstances, I would know how far they were on in their teaching practice. I would have right. seen lesson plans from them because I'm also a teaching practice supervisor. Uh, and suddenly I had nothing. So okay. that's not quite answered your question, but maybe that gives... The... There's definitely an insight. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we had three presentations on music teachers in in, uh, in schools, we on on German classes uh, in um, uh, primary schools, and on um, uh, a course on uh, within teacher education online course on on teaching English as foreign language. Um, and, and what's striking is that actually the tree build on each other and we give a more and more insight in what, what's actually happening. And, and I have the feeling of looking at research being done now in the context of uh, the COVID pandemic is that we, we start looking at the, the general picture about concerns and what's happening in ICT usage and slowly we're moving into, but what's actually happening in the classroom? If, if we take different methodologies, what's the impact of that? And then it's interesting to see, but if we, if we look at those impacts, what actually are the design criteria for good online interactions? Uh, and I think the, this, these three presentations very, very nicely build upon each other in that way. Because I, I have the feeling that we know a lot and, and, and based on research about um, uh, effective design of teaching and learning uh, arrangement in physical classrooms or physical teacher education courses. And I think the challenge is still to, to use our experience now, and, but also to use those more general uh, design principles to think again about what, what does it imply for designing uh, classroom activities um, uh, or uh, teacher education courses. I have a feeling that we're just on, on really at the beginning of, of getting a close understanding of what is really effective in teacher educational classrooms if we use distance learning method methodologies. So I'm very curious what, what your ideas are on this um, and, and what might be the implication maybe also for teacher education research or teacher education policy if we want to get a closer understanding of quality issues in distance learning teacher education activities. Anyone who would like to address this issue or another issue which came up in your thoughts and ideas? Maybe if I just throw in a, a, a thought that maybe provoke people to start with. One of my difficulties as a teacher educator is wondering how is this tension between how much I looking at undergraduate education how much I have to give because there are certain expectations of the curriculum and how much I can elicit and how much I can create a situation where the learners discover and I have great difficulty finding the balance between these things. I think that's an interesting question. It relates for me very much to one of the outcomes of the webinar we had in April, organized by the University of Tallinn, where one of the questions was is how to strengthen the agency of uh, uh, pupils or students or student teachers. And I think it's very much related to that one. Uh, Mirka, you want to respond to this one? Yeah, uh, for me, as teacher educator in this COVID time, was uh, for example very difficult in primary in education of primary education student teachers 
when we started to program because my students were not visible. I couldn't see what they do and uh, I uh, they couldn't and many times they didn't want to share the their um, uh, their computer their monitor so what was very important for me that i uh, get feedback from them through verbal description what was happened and how find uh, the mistake or how to describe the, the result yeah so i saw that this situation provoke us to verbalize more perfect and in detail uh, the situation of product of uh, learning situation so it, it improved the ability to communicate about what was happened because uh, and how to find the mistake yeah? uh, you can imagine if you for example do some programs each student is in another situation and uh, so you must you must solve the problem you cannot tell sorry i cannot help you so this was very uh, this i saw very uh, very well and the same i could see when i when i was uh, visiting virtually the classroom of my student teacher uh, who did uh, informatics uh, also online and i could see how verbally his students speak about what what they do and where is a, where is a problem what what to do so this verbalizing uh, mistakes and situation helped us to understand how students learn and think about problems so thank you anna you want to respond to this question too Um, I think um, cert certainly the reflective part that Mirka was just talking about, um, I found very striking, particularly in, in Melanie's presentation. It was more, the point was more linking perhaps what Melanie was saying to Christina's, um, Christina's work that I found it this, this idea of the, um, the teacher presence and thinking about how teacher education can build an understanding of the of of the of that um really struck me and what i mean by that is it seems that you know the, the importance of teachers in having ownership of their own design and reflection on that design um and the creation of their own materials i guess which is part of their their identity and their sense of their own pedagogical having their own pedagogical design rather than just uh repeating the pedagogical design of others so melanie said you know you could try not to take this story from the course book but choose one and do it in your own way and christina you made your own videos and you were thinking about efficiency now probably efficiency would be for some state organization to create a thousand videos and you choose number 23 for tuesday morning's lesson um that would be efficient they could watch it you don't have to do anything but as your own student said you were in it and also you were there in the video conference to be their personal support that they could engage in um i also have a bit of a problem with producing videos not by the teacher because there are external people making profit out of teachers and i have a bit of an issue with that but i'll leave that aside but i think for me this this idea of helping particularly beginning teachers to feel that they're developing and reflecting on their own kind of teaching resources and pedagogy seems to be coming out of this um it existed before but it seems to be coming out that was my kind of i suppose a reflection thank you any other questions or comments or thoughts you want to share Actually, I, I was thinking, um, I, I have the impression and also something what I heard more um, uh, from colleagues and teachers in the Netherlands that um, the whole lockdown and the distance learning which the resulted from that actually 
uh, created a, a rather traditional approach in teaching um, that um, in online situations, teachers tend to 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 teach um, um, in a very traditional and, and frontal way. Um, so that, that for me that raises the question that I think many teachers um, uh, have developed tendencies and ways and and, and 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 approaches which tries to involve students quite strongly. I think that that was Melanie's point. So how to engage students, how to share responsibilities in the classroom. Uh, but then when we were disrupted in our traditions uh, um, and we had to find new ways and had to do it online, that the easiest way we, we, we might refer to was again to do it in a more or less traditional way. Um, so it actually, it, it, it questions for me to, to what extent there's still that underlying archetype of a teacher is someone who's talking to students. And, and I think the challenge is very much also also in online situations, how to share responsibility uh, with pupils instead of taking the initiative. For, and, and, and I think it's, it's very, it has very positive intention because you feel responsible for pupils and now I have to help them online, etc. But the, the question is how to do it in such a way that you transfer responsibility to students or to student teachers instead of taking all that responsibility yourself. Um, so, no, that's just a, a thought. I'm not sure what, what, what the answer would be, but... Jason? Yes, I think that during the pandemic, we realized also that this responsibility is shared also with the parents, not only with the students and the teachers. Yeah, and that was very much Christina's final remark, that yes, it, yes. It's, it's together with parents. And I think that's a very, very... It's very good uh, uh, and, and just justified observation. Yeah, yeah. That again raises the question: to what extent teachers involve parents not only during online lessons, but also when we turn back to physical normal classrooms, and how to engage parents in that uh, in that situation. I'd, I'd just like to add in the point here, if, if we're, we're getting to involve parents in teaching, then what about equity? Because not all children have that support. Yes, I think that's, that's a correct and, 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 and good observation at the same time. But I think that we have uh, to educate a little bit more parents to create a situation, a balanced situation. That means um, it is very uh, important to work harder with parents to achieve a level of them, uh, to be a real partner in education. Without them, we are not uh, in our trial to achieve the success with the kid because um, Kids spend a lot of time out of school. That means uh, even that we will be brilliant as a teacher, they need support um, from family. That means uh, not only uh, support that it's connected with needs uh, that are not connected uh, with uh, intellectual activity, but in every single detail. We can improve family life through the um, supporting with psychoeducation uh, families, not um, father and mother, but families in um, um, holistic uh, vision, I think. Um, we will try to find the best way to collaborate with our, uh, with our communities uh, to share some uh, pr uh, parents' uh, practice uh, with, that means parents with parents to understand how uh, family work uh, in this uh, point of view, that means to collaborate with a teacher, to collaborate with school, which are the results, and every single family want the best for, uh, for uh, their hair, that means they're trying to make uh, the best 
uh, for their kids. So we collaborate with us. I have the experience in Albania that are really, really fascinating. Uh, when you inspire um, the community, as you inspire the, the, the parents to show them that uh, can be in different way. You do the maximum for their child and what they are doing for their hair. It is very, very productive, I think. Thank you very much for this contribution. And I think you, you're both right. I think uh, the, the, the importance of parents and, and wider families, but at the same time, I think my Melanie's point, and I can recognize that because I, I realized that during the COVID times that teachers got a more, much more closer inside of home situations of, of pupils and how that can support, but sometimes even disrupt the learning, learning process. So I think you're both right in that, that respect. Uh, Anna? Yes, thank you. It was um, it's I, I try and try and link the point because I wanted to mention the interesting presentation by um, Tina and Mira about music education, because as they said at the beginning, this is, you know, you know if you're talking about resources and what you have at home, um, I'm lucky enough to have a piano, but I'm pretty sure one out of my whole apartment block, only one of my neighbours, any other people to have that. Um, and that's that, that, that's, that can be a practical resources issue, but I'm also, it was sort of a question to Mira and Tina about attitudes as well. As you said, Marco, you were talking about traditional ways of teaching. And I think for music education, something I've heard is, um, I'm trying to think of examples. So something that you'd have at home, a coffee mug and a pen, you could go. Now, to some people that would be starting off ideas about rhythm and music to other music teachers or curriculum designers, that is not music education. Music education is your violin, your piano, your listening to uh, a symphony. It's, it's, there are kind of, when you talk about traditional, um, I think those that kind of, there are sort of almost cultural societal shifts <laughs> that, that, that need to happen here. And to bring it round to teacher education again, there's possibly, I think, for, I mean, I'd like to hear from, you know, again, from Tina and Mira, you were talking about the sort of the Academy of Music and the kind of expectations that new music teachers, or indeed all teachers, can have through their teacher education of actually what their subject is and can be. And it's not just about using digital tools in case there's a pandemic, it's using digital tools because it can actually expand and diversify the notion of music or, or whatever. I'm sorry, I might have been throwing a bit of a big explosion into the discussion, but I really want to, I really valued your presentation. So I, I was interested um, and you can tell that I used to be a music teacher. So. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. I completely agree with you. And I think that uh, we as uh, music educators uh, need to, to tell uh, and to talk and collaborate uh, with other teachers in a way that music is all around us. Everything can be a teacher. Like you, like you presented uh, before, uh, this is also music and uh, we need to encourage pupils at the primary schools uh, to sing, to create something, to perform something, because uh, I think that a lot of uh, pupils in the primary schools have a lot of problems with singing, that they, they would like to sing and that they uh, want to sing something because uh, they have a lot of uh, problems with intonations and with the rhythm and uh, harmonies and this could be a big problem and i need uh, i think that uh, because i i'm assistant professor at the academy of music and i guided uh, i guided students uh, also in a, this practical way how to teach uh, how to be a further uh, music teachers and we are uh, we are talking a lot about this um, how about motivation because now now uh, in this covid uh, pan pandemic time uh, we could see a very big problem of motivation in music lessons. Uh, 
uh, in these classrooms, not at distance teaching, uh, but this is the, the lack uh, of motivation due to the distance teaching. And uh, we need to, to encourage for further situation, encourage this uh, motivation of yourself. Uh, and um, also, um, how to say, uh, these traditional uh, crucial fundamentals, uh, creating, singing, and uh, performing, this is crucial for also for further teaching in supporting of ICT usage, of course. But this traditional, uh, tra traditional learning is, I think, the most important uh, than this that we uh, that the majority of lessons are using uh, ICT usage. Okay, thank you very much. It's it's uh, a quarter past four, so we've reached the end of our session, unfortunately. Um, as um, uh, Eva, uh, who was chairing what the first session I was in, was saying, well, it's a pity that it's the end of the session, but the good news is that there is more to come, uh, which will be tomorrow. There will be another uh, uh, round of parallel sessions, and then there will be um, uh, a panel discussion on the, the key elements that came out of um, both Friday and Saturday, uh, the, the Thursday and Friday discussions. Uh, Hannah uh, from the European Commission will be part of that panel. Uh, so uh, I see Hannah there uh, Saturday morning, and I hope to see you, uh, the others, uh, also on Saturday morning. Um, and it's I think I would like to, to thank Tina, uh, Mira, uh, uh, Melanie, and um, uh, where are you, uh, Christina, very, very much for your uh, presentation. I think the three presentations build very much on each other. And at the same time, they show there's still a lot to learn if we're talking about distance learning in education and in teacher education. Um, for the panel discussion tomorrow, it would be great to have some input from you. Um, and I'm looking at, uh, at Eva because Eva has pre present, uh, prepared a very short questionnaire to see what the, um, the main elements are that you took from the discussions today or the discussion yesterday to give some input for the uh, panel discussion tomorrow. Uh, Eva, how is that um, uh, evaluation shared? Is it sent yeah, to the email? Very, yeah, thank you very much. I guess that Igor already sent email out. Three minutes ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To Just or... check your email and uh, we really appreciate your uh, input uh, for tomorrow's discussions. Only two questions. <laughs> Simple and straightforward. So. Well, thank you very much all. Uh, enjoy the remaining part of the afternoon and the evening. And I hope to see you tomorrow uh, in the final part of, uh, of our conference. Yes?